Hello and welcome to the ArcGIS Pro SDK for .NET talk on an overview of the Utility Network Management API. So today we're going to cover a number of different topics. We'll talk about getting started with the Utility Network API, and then kind of go through a survey of the different classes and methods that are available. Finally, we'll wrap this up with a what's new section, um, talking about the road ahead and some hints for learning more. So scattered through the talk, we'll also have some code demos um, to show you how to use this um, in practice. Let's get started. So if you want to learn about how the Utility Network API works, probably the best place to start is to just do a search for ArcGIS Pro SDK or type in the address above and that will get you to a, um, a help page which gives you all the information on the Pro SDK. So in terms of the utility network portion of this, um, just a reminder, if, if you haven't used the Pro SDK before, this is a managed.net SDK. Um, this part that we're going to talk about today provides access to the utility network. This is an object-oriented SDK that aligns with modern C-sharp practices and existing frameworks, and it, it adheres to the principles and architecture um, that the rest of the Pro SDK does. And for the rest of this um, presentation today, I'm going to assume that you have a basic understanding of the utility network information model. Um, if you don't have this yet, there are two additional Dev Summit presentations on this, so you can um, go watch those and then come back and watch this one. All right, let's start with some architectural topics. Um, first, I want to mention that the UN API, along with the rest of the Pro SDK is DML only. So DML is data manipulation language. Um, and then I'm going to talk about threading. So in terms of the DML only, um, what we're saying here is that schema creation and modification operations, such as you know creating a domain network, adding or deleting a rule, um, assigning a a category, all of those kinds of operations that edit the schema. These need to be performed using Python um, against your source data. So this is, like I said, pretty much in alignment with the rest of the GeoDatabase API. You know, routines to create tables and so forth um, are also only run through Python. Now, of course, you can call Python from C Sharp using the GeoProcessing API. So there's an example um, example two lines of code showing you how to, how to call the uh, import rules GP tool. Now in terms of threading, um, like the other geodatabase routines in the API, almost all of these methods should be called on the main sim thread. So what that means is you your code typically is structured like it shows at the bottom. You run your code inside um, a delegate that's passed to queued task run. So there's a link there telling you um, how to, uh, a link telling you more instructions about how this all works in ArcGIS Pro. The basic idea is that you have many utility, uh, many user interface threads, but then you um, put all of your utility network and geodatabase code through a single thread to make sure that everything is kept in sync properly. So in terms of a little bit more architecture stuff, everything that we're talking about here is in the arcgis.core.data.utility network namespace. There are two additional sub namespaces for tracing and network diagrams. Um, so all of this stuff is pretty low in the stack and everything in those namespaces will work both as a pro add-in and in core host. However, there are some places where these objects down at the low level need to integrate with ArcGIS Pro at a higher level. So the way we do that is we provide C Sharp extension methods. So to use the extension methods, you need to add a reference to ArcGIS.desktop.extensions to your solution. And then you put a using ArcGIS.core.data.utilitynetwork.extensions at the top of your source file. So when you do those two steps, you'll get additional extension methods that appear as if they're regular methods on the utility network classes. So the idea is you can then do things. Um, so one example is you would validate topology 
And if you use the validate topology and edit operation extension method, then the pro undo redo stack is notified um, of your changes and you can undo and redo stuff. I'll point them out as we go through here. Um, but these again, these extension methods are intended to use with ArcGIS Pro in add-ins. If you're using core host, there are lower level routines you can call to do these same operations. Worth pointing out, there are other ways to access the utility network. Um, you can use geoprocessing models and Python scripts. And of course, if you um, are familiar with coding against REST, you can directly code against the REST APIs. Um, don't don't recommend doing that inside a pro add-in. Too many places where um, pro won't get aware, won't be aware of the change you make, won't get synced up properly. So don't do that. All right, so I'm going to do a quick survey here of all the different utility network APIs that are available. So, you know, there's a lot of classes and a lot of methods here. So what I do logically is I divide this up into, into nine different sections. And you'll see this diagram here repeated throughout the presentation. Um, just want to make sure everyone knows this is not a layered architecture by any means. This is simply just a way of um, grouping them and making it easier to talk about them. So the presentation today is going to go through each of these sections. And in fact, if you read the conceptual doc on the website, you'll see that it follows a similar organization. So let's start by talking about the utility network class. So this is the root object that provides access to the utility network API. It's kind of our central hub. And you can get it from a geodatabase. You can call the geodatabase open data set routine um, and pass in the name of the utility network and that will get you a utility network object back. If you have a feature class or a table, you can call table.getControllerDataset, and that will return a list of controller datasets for a feature class. And one of those controller datasets would be a utility network if you're passing this on a utility network class. And finally, if you have a pointer to the utility network layer, you can call getUtilityNetwork um, on that object to get the utility network itself. So rather than talking about this in abstract, I'm going to hand this over to Dave Crawford to show us some code on how to get this utility network object. Thank you very much, Rich, for that nice overview of our API and our, our overall pro-managed SDK for the utility network, or at least the, the beginnings of it. So let me jump right in here with a nice demonstration of how we're going to show you how it is that you can use the pro-managed SDK in conjunction with um, ArcGIS Pro to work with the utility network object, its object itself, and to write some nice customizations. Obviously, the very first thing you have to do to be able to work with it is to get the utility network object. So this first demo is going to show that. So what I've got here on the screen is a Naperville Electric sample data set. It's got a utility network right here in it. It also has a few subtype, a few sub layers. Each of these is a subtype group layer that contains all of the subtypes of each of the large feature classes. What I've done is I've, I've customized my project with this add-in tab to have a bunch of buttons in it that we're going to use throughout our demos here to sort of walk our th way through the utility network, some of the editing behavior, some of the network diagram behaviors that the utility network supports through the ProManage SDK. So to begin with, I'm going to start by clicking my Accessing the Utility Network button here and jump right into the code behind. And what we're going to see is there's actually three ways to open the utility network that I'm going to show. Theoretically, there is probably a fourth or a fifth way, and I think as we go through this, you might see where those are, but these are the three big sort of important ways to do it. The first is sort of the headless core host app way of opening uh, utility network, and that is directly from the geodatabase itself. So I'm going to press F11 and step into that method, and what we're going to see in here is that first I set the utility network uh, object as null outside of the context of this queued task.run. The reason for that is that this queued task.run actually forces everything inside of it to execute on the main sim thread. But because it runs through a lambda expression and through this, through this open little uh, wait mechanism, any variables you define within here are not accessible beyond the scope of that queued task.run. 
So I define my utility network object before it. I then jump in. Now I use the URL directly to my feature server. That is the geodatabase. We formerly would open geodatabases using connection properties, using strings, using a path to a file geodatabase. Now, because of the service-based architecture of ArcGIS Pro and the utility network, we actually obtain it directly through the URL itself. That gives us the workspace. From the workspace, we actually look for all of our utility network definition objects. We then iterate through because I happen to know that in my workspace there's only one definition or one utility network that has a definition. And from that definition, I can actually ask it for the appropriate name in order to open the utility network itself. I get the object. Because I've set it outside to the variable outside of the context, it is now available here for me to return out to the caller. Now I can step through here and notice that I, when I look at the name, it has this funny little naming convention. So the reason why, going through the geodatabase, we open with definitions instead of with names directly is that the feature service DB, which is the database on the client side that interprets and connects to our services, uses a prefixing uh, style to create the name of the object. For example, in this case, L950, Electric Utility Network. Well, my utility network is actually called Electric Utility Network. But the 950 is the layer within the service being referred to that references my utility network. It's a tough name to figure out if you're trying to open it directly like this, which is why I always recommend you open the definition object, ask that for its name, and then turn around and open it. Obviously, if you have several utility networks in one workspace that you're trying to open, one service, you're going to need to go through them and provide some sort of a compare condition or something to distinguish which one you're looking for. So that's the geodatabase style. The next two styles are much more uh, map-centric or pro-centric, working with layers and maps to be able to open a utility network. So there's a couple ways you can do that. The first way that I'm going to show here is from the subtype layer itself. So as I had showed uh, in the devices within my pro, it broke out all those different subtypes. The way it does that is by using this subtype group layer. Through the API, I can find layers that are subtype group layers. As long as it's not equal to null, it means it is a group, to a group layer. I can then just pull out the first layer within there, which in my case is the unknown subtype. But it really doesn't matter because all I'm trying to get to is the table that lives behind that um, layer. Now you'll notice again that I'm jumping into a QTAS.run even though I'm working with layers. The reason for this is that the second you want to work with the geodatabase itself, its DML, its DDL, all of its operations itself, you need to put yourself onto the main SIM thread. That's the only thread that can correctly work with geodatabases in a customizable fashion like this. So I go inside my QTAS.run, I grab the table from my feature layer, I then just ask that table, hey, do you support controller data sets? Now, most of our tables will support controller data sets, um, but there will be certain ones, shape files, that will not. And so you put this check to make sure you don't end up in an area where you're going to start throwing exceptions only because you're asking questions that the data set is telling you it can't answer. So now I'm going to ask this layer table, hey, what actual controller data sets do you have? In this case, we have one, and it is a utility network. Obviously, that makes it easier. I can just say, grab me the controller as a data set. And the advantage is I can still ask that controller, are you a data set of type utility network? In my case, it is. And therefore, I now have the utility network object. I can run through, and I can return that utility network up to the caller. And as you can see, it has the same utility network name as when I opened it from the geodatabase, and it has the same type, utility network. The last way is probably the easiest way through code to, and to open utility networks. As you can see, it's a much smaller method that I've written. It's only about 20 lines of code, not even, and that includes all of my brackets and spacings. But what I'm going to do is I just start searching through all the layers, and I say, hey, when you find me the layer that is the utility network layer, let's go do something. So in this case, I have my utility network layer. Again, I set that utility network property or variable outside of my QTAS.run, but I do still have to get inside of a QTAS on the main SIM thread in order to open that utility network object. Again, I'm going to the database, the geodatabase, I'm opening it from there. That operation must occur on the main SIM thread. 
And all of these operations, if you were to hover over them or do, using IntelliSense as you type, will say must be called from the MCT, that is the main SIM thread. To do that, you use this QTask.run mechanism. I grab my utility network, and then I, def I set the definition on it just because I might want to use it later, but there's no reason to do that. I have the actual utility network. I now check it again to make sure that it gave me all the information I'm expecting. The name is correct. The type is correct. And once my code finishes running, it will give me back uh, focus and control to the UI to ArcGIS Pro. So back to you, Rich, and then we will uh, go through some further demos later on. So let's move on now and talk about definition and schema classes. So these are a set of classes and methods that provide information about the utility network schema. So I'm not going to go through each of these in big detail. The idea is that you start with the utility network definition. And from there, there are classes that represent all of the different objects in the utility network information model. So there's a class for domain networks and for network sources and network attributes and so on. This is all read-only access, and the idea about these classes is they are value objects that are derived from information cached with the feature service when you connect to it, or read from the file geodatabase if you're using that platform. So accessing these methods do not require round-trip um, calls to databases or services, so they're quite quick. Let's move on now to elements. Um, element, what an element is, is it's the basic encapsulation of a row in the utility network API. So you could think of it as a row of a feature class inside the utility network plus either a terminal or percent along edge, depending on how, how you're using this element. So elements are used in a number of different places. They're used to create and delete associations. They're used to specify starting points and barriers for use with tracing, and they're returned as results from traces. So there's a set of create element factory methods on the utility network class that allows you to create these. Let's move on to network topology. So this is routines that query the topological index. So as you probably know, the utility network topology stores all the connectivity, containment, and attachment information used by the utility network to perform its analysis. This topology is constructed from features that are geometrically coincident, in other words, having the same x, y, and z, along with associations, in combination with a powerful rules engine. So after you make updates to your features, you update and validate the topology by calling an extension method on the utility network class called validate network topology in edit operation. And what this will do is this will update the topology based on all of the changes that took place to the features within a particular extent. Important to realize that with the utility network, we do not provide access to fine-grained topology. That means you can't navigate through the network um, from a you know point to edge to point to edge kind of fashion the way you could with the geometric network. What we've done instead is we've created a much more powerful tracing framework that allows all of that navigation to take place on the server. So associations, we have a number of routines and classes that allow you to query and edit associations between utility network rows. Um, so again, we have the three kinds of associations. We have connectivity associations that allows you to connect two points that are not coincident to one another. We have containment associations used to designate that one feature is a container and contains other features. So for example, a switch cabinet could contain a set of switches and fuses. And then we have a structural attachment association, which is used to model structurally attaching a device or assembly to a structure. So an example here might be a transformer bank attached to a pole. So storing these as associations rather than as um, related objects as they were in the past allows tracing to make use of this information without having to go and fetch features and do additional queries. So on the query side with associations you can get associations for a given element and for the editing you can create and edit associations. Let's move on to subnetworks. 
So subnetworks are a management of features that allows organizations to optimize the delivery of resources and track the status of a network. So a subnetwork is used to model things such as a circuit, an electric network, or maybe a gas pressure zone or a cathodic protection zone in a pipe network. So the subnetwork routines start with a class called the subnetwork manager. And the subnetwork manager is obtained from, you guessed it, the utility network object itself. So there's a number of things you can do with this um, with the subnetwork manager class. You can query and allows you to get a list of subnetworks based on the tier and the state. And you can edit subnetworks. And you do that by adding and removing controllers. Now these two routines, edit controller in edit operation and disable controller in edit operation, are again examples of these extension methods. And what this will do is it'll allow you to create or, excuse me, enable or disable controller and have that happen and have that added to the pro undo redo stack. You can also update all the subnetworks from this routine. Once you, um, going back a slide here, so the get subnetworks allows you to retrieve a list of subnetworks, as I mentioned, and when you have those individual subnetworks, you can update them individually using the update method here. One thing worth pointing out is that after you update a subnetwork, you should redraw the map afterwards. So the way to do that is to get the map view and call redraw true on that, and that will um, flush any feature caches that are in place and will redraw the feature redraw the map using the updated features. You can also use the subnetwork line, the subnetwork class, sorry, to fetch the subnet line feature as well as to return a set of system network diagrams associated with the subnetwork. Now probably the most interesting part of the utility network API is tracing. So, you know, from a computer science perspective, uh, tracing is assembling a subset of utility network elements that meet a particular criteria. Of course, what its real value is, is as business value, and its business value is to do things like answer questions about the current state of the network, um, help design future facilities, and help organize business practices. So there's a lot of different components that go into calling the trace routines in this API. So first of all, different kinds of traces are implemented with different tracer objects. Then we have a trace argument that encapsulates the different input parameters for a trace. And then this generates a set of result objects as output. So we're going to go through and cover each of these steps in more detail. So on the tracer side, the tracers define the tracing algorithm to be used. There's a method, there's a class called the trace manager that's used to create these tracer objects. And of course you get the trace manager from the utility network class. So there's a number of different tracers um, in the system, one for all the traces we support. You create one of those, and then you create a trace argument, which consolidates all the different parameters, the starting points, the barriers, what kinds of results you want, and the full trace configuration. So that trace configuration itself is broken up into a number of different sections. And in the set of slides that follow, I'm going to match up um, on the left, you see some of the properties, some of the basic properties in the trace configuration class, including things like include containers, include content, include structures. And you can see on the right hand side, the trace geoprocessing pane from Pro, and you can see how these things uh, map to one another. It's a fairly straightforward um, connection between the two. So for defining traversability of, of your trace, you can base that on barriers and function barriers. So what this does is it sets up the criteria upon which a trace will stop. You can do that by comparing network attributes. So you see there in the, the box on the right, um, operational device status is equal to open. And if that condition is met by a feature, it will stop the trace. You can also check for the existence of a category, and you can combine these together using AND and OR operations to form more complex filters. Now, in addition to um, 
this kind of barrier, we also support function barriers that evaluate a functional expression. So an example here might be, I want to stop my trace after the sum of the shape length is greater than or equal to 1300 meters. And what that will do is that will create a trace that goes out 1300 meters in every direction and then stops. Now another thing you can specify is a set of functions. That these functions calculate values based on a network attribute and the idea here is that you can obtain those results at the conclusion of the trace. So not only can you return a set of features, but you can also return information about those features. So in this example here, we're adding the transformer load for all of the transformers that um, are on phase A. Now filters are another mechanism to stop tracing, and they stop tracing when returning results. So it's a little bit hard sometimes to get the, the difference between traversability and filters. Um, what traversability does is the first stage of a trace, it uses traversability, if it's a subnetwork trace, it uses traversability to find where the subnetwork sources are. So subnetwork sub controllers, the, the sources or the sinks, depending on the kind of network you have. So what a filter does is a filter takes place after the traversability and it filters the results that come back but does not stop traversability to, to the controller. So the best way to explain that, I know that's a little abstract, the best way to explain that is to use an example. So in this example here we're returning the next upstream protected device and we're doing that by creating a filter barrier that stops when the category of the feature is equal to protective, has a category equal to protective. Now what's interesting is if you did that with traversability, the trace is going to fail. And the reason the trace is going to fail is if it finds an upstream protective device in between you and the subnetwork controller, it won't find the subnetwork controller and it won't be able to determine which way is upstream and which way is downstream. So for this kind of trace, you would have a traversability set for something like um, stop when um, operational status is open, but then the filter you would stop when the category equals protective. So different ways to define filters. You can use a condition based on network attributes or categories. You can use a functional expression. Um, both of those are like traversability, it just happens at a different stage of the trace. We also have a thing called a bit set filter and a nearest neighbor filter. Now I want to talk about this filter by bit set network attribute thing. Um, there are cases when traces need to be aware that a network attribute is a bit set that controls traversability. So kind of the classic example here is when phase is represented as a bit set network attribute. So I want you to consider this picture here. On the left hand side we have that yellow star representing the subnetwork controller and there's a three phase line that comes out from that controller. At some place down the line it splits into three single phase devices. So you see those circles A, B, and C and they join together again to go downstream through the rest of this ABC line. The dashed lines are because there are actually connectivity associations there between the endpoints of the three-phase line and the devices itself. So let's just say we place a starting point on this B-phase device. And what happens if you do an upstream trace? Now, if you don't have filter by bit set network attribute returned, you get some really strange results. And the reason why is there's actually three paths that you can go upstream from this B phase device. You can go directly there. You can go up and a, you can go down to the ABC line and then up through the A phase device. Or you could go down to the endpoint and up through the C phase device. Now, that's correct from a topological perspective, but most electrical engineers would would look at that a little bit funny, right? So the idea behind the filter by network Net, bit set network attribute is you set your 
network attribute for phase equal to that value, and then it will correctly figure out that because you placed the starting point on that B phase line, B phase device, excuse me, it will only go up from B up to the controller, and these other roundabout paths won't be returned. The one final step for tracing is output filtering. So this takes place after traversability, after filtering, after function calculation. And the idea here is you can restrict the features that are returned in the output set. You can restrict those either by a condition or by including a set of asset types to return. And finally, we have propagators. Propagators are kind of an advanced piece of functionality that does not, by default, show up in the trace geoprocessing tool. What a propagator does is it defines the propagation of a network attribute along as a traversal. So they're really only applicable to subnetwork-based traces, for example, the subnetwork trace, the upstream trace, downstream, and so forth. So there's a couple canonical examples. The first is phase propagation. Um, so when you have a phase represented as a single attribute, some open devices along the network will restrict some phases from continuing along the trace. And the other example would be um, pressure. So if you wanted to propagate the pressure of a gas network down from the subnetwork controller, you can do that. So propagators work by doing this as a pre-processing step before the main trace takes place. What happens is that starting at each controller, um, the propagator uses the propagator function and the network attribute to calculate a value at each element downstream. And that goes through the entire extent of the subnetwork. And then during the trace itself, this propagator filter um, is tested at the same time as traversal filters. OK, so you do all your trace, and then you get back a set of result objects. So right now we have two different kinds of result objects. You can return elements and you can return function output results. The idea is that in the trace argument dot result types enum you provide an array of enum values and you'll get back one result object for every enum value you put in to the trace argument result types um, list. So right now we support these two, um, the first being a list of element objects. So this is a read-only list of element. Um, one thing worth pointing out here, some people have been confused because the element has a property on it called percent along edge. That percent along edge is used when you're creating an element as a starting point or a barrier to um, allow you to place that starting point or barrier midpoint along an edge. Now when you're getting trace results back, you get back the entire feature. So that percent along edge property is always going to be is always going to be zero. It's going to return all the entire feature, not just the piece of the feature that you might logically think is part of the trace results. Okay, the other thing you do is we get back if you pass in functions and you pass in that enum to return the function outputs, you get back a set of function output objects, which is basically a function value pair. Now in the future, we are considering different result types to add to this list. Um, for example, we might return connectivity information, we might return geometry, or network diagrams, or you know, there's other things that we're considering for future releases as well. And the idea is that when we do support these in a future releases, we'll just add a value to the result type enum, and we'll add a new concrete subclass to the result class, and that's how that will work. OK, so again, to summarize, you take your tracer, you take your trace argument with all the inputs, and you get back a set of result objects at the end. All right, that was a lot, I know. Now we're going to move into network diagrams. So network diagram SDK allows developers to query and edit network diagrams. So guess what? There's a diagram manager class. I know that's a big surprise, right? Uh, this class comes from the utility network class, as the other ones do. 
And you can use this class to create network diagrams or retrieve templates, retrieve diagrams, or retrieve the network associated with those diagrams. So the network diagram class represents a diagram, obviously enough. Um, there's some key routines on here, for example, updating, append, um, storing, deleting, applying layout, and so forth. Now a network diagram consists of a set of diagram elements that are either containers, junctions, or uh, containers. Containers, junctions, or edges, sorry. You can retrieve these diagram elements by type, um, by extent, or by a set of object IDs. So for example, you could do a diagram element query by extent class and return all the diagram elements within an extent on your diagram. So we do support custom layouts and the way that custom layouts work is that you would query for a set of diagram elements then you take those elements and you see um, going back a slide, going back two slides, you see there's a shape property on the diagram element so when you're writing your custom layout you would take your collection of elements and modify their shapes then you'd add those diagram elements to a network diagram subset object and then pass that to network diagram that save layout. And what that will let you do is it'll let you change the geometry of a set of the elements inside a diagram. So you can do either a portion of the diagram or you can do the entire thing and allow you to write your own custom algorithms for that. All right, so we're going to turn this over to David now to go back and dig into some code and show us how network diagrams work. So that was obviously a nice walkthrough of the basic APIs, the tracing APIs, some of our network diagram APIs available through the Pro Managed SDK. So now I'm going to do a demonstration of the network diagrams component of the uh, SDK. And in that, I'm actually going to touch a little bit on the tracing SDK as well. Um, so let's get to it. So again, we're back to our, our uh, same map, our same utility network with our Naperville sample data. So the first thing we're going to do is just go look at diagrams and what sort of diagrams exist in this network. So where we do that is on the utility network tab itself. Over in our little diagram section, we can see this find diagrams button. This launches the find diagrams pane and loads in all of those diagrams that are currently available in this utility network. What you can see here is that you have a couple with this yellow exclamation point. What this means is that we've done some editing to the actual feature space well, we did not yet update these diagrams. Well, why do they know they're inconsistent? Because this green exclamation point says that these diagrams are actually system maintained or system generated diagrams. And every time you run update subnetwork, they are automatically recreated. To, to phrase it slightly better, not recreated, but redrawn based on the edits that have been made into that subnetwork. Now, within these system diagrams, if we take a look at one of them, for example, this RMT001, what has happened is a subnetwork trace has been executed to generate the diagram. And then a whole bunch of node reduction um, has been applied, as well as some compression. And then we've also had this diagram laid out in a geo position. So this obviously gives, gives the user a little bit of sense of, of sort of the key bits in their diagram. This is what we call a switching diagram. So the switches are obviously the most important thing for this particular subnetwork. So now we can close this. And what we're going to do is use the SDK, which natively, again, plugs right into ArcGIS Pro. And in my case, I've plugged it in via a button again, network diagram creation. And we're going to try to accomplish a couple different things. First. We're going to attempt to take that system diagram that is currently geo-positioned, and we want to assign a smart tree algorithm to it. We just want it to lay out in a slightly nicer way. We then would like to generate a brand new diagram for a different circuit, circuit RMT003. And what we want it to look like is actually like this diagram that I've already pre-generated for RMT001. And what this is, is this is just a full subnetwork trace of RMT001, and the example we're going to do, RMT003, without any special uh, node reductions or algorithms applied to it. It's just a basic um, geo schematic. But what we also want to do is actually set it up as a smart tree as we go. 
And the last thing we want to do is actually t use one of uh, a very fancy out diagram template that we have, which is called a tracing template. And what that's going to allow me to do is pick a single feature and generate a diagram that looks very similar to our subnetwork diagrams. So let's take a look at how those work. So what we do is we click our button. So again, it takes us into our code behind. So now we're down in, in, in the pro managed SDK. So we can start to take a look at what's going on. So the first one we're going to do is creating a diagram from an existing diagram. What it really means is updating an existing diagram. So we step into that method. We again open our utility network. Open the, This time we're going to open the diagram manager. This is the class that does all of the work with diagrams. If you need to find templates, if you need to find a, diagram, a specific diagram or anything else, the diagram manager is where that is all accomplished. So in this case, we're going to look for a diagram template, in this case just called basic. And then what we're going to do is try to find all of the network diagrams within our utility network. So they're all returned. We see that there was nine. That matches what we saw on the pane. And then we can iterate through them. And what we're looking for is the diagram that contains RMT001 and is a system diagram. So the very first one that it finds is actually that system diagram. So then it allows me to step in. And what we're going to do is we are just going to apply a smart tree algorithm to it. So what we do is we have these layout parameter classes. You generate a new layout parameter class using the new keyword in C sharp. You assign that to a variable, in this case, this diagram layout. You use the diagram that you already have and you apply that layout algorithm. Now that we are done, we can exit out of this method. And what we're going to do here is I'm just going to drag the cursor across the other ones, and we'll get to those other ones in just a second, but allow it to come back to the, to the ArcGIS Pro. I can open up this diagram, and what we're going to see is now that system diagram that was previously generated with a geo position now has um, now has the smart tree applied. Unfortunately, there was a slight caching issue there, so you just hit the refresh button in the lower right hand here, and that tells you what it actually looks like. So now we can close that, and now we can move on to the next part of this demo. Back in the same button, this time I'm going to drag the cursor over top of that first method, because now I want to do is create a diagram from a trace. So this will now integrate sort of two different parts of our SDK that Richard discussed and talked about, both the tracing part of the SDK as well as the diagram. So what I'm going to do is, from my utility network, I'm going to seek out a specific domain network, in this case, my electric domain network. Within that, I am then going to seek out a specific tier, the tier that contains the subnetwork I'm interested in. In this case, that's the electric distribution tier. I'm then going to grab what we call our subnetwork manager, much the same way that there is a trace manager, a diagram manager, there is a subnetwork manager. This is where we go to find our subnetworks. So in this case, I'm going to go find the subnetwork called RMT003. It returns out to me. And now I'm going to generate a trace against that subnetwork. So we create a trace manager. Again, the manager class and the manager style is very consistent throughout the managed SDK here, especially in the utility network space. So I'm going to generate a new subnetwork tracer. A, a new tracer with the type of subnetwork tracer, I should say. I am going to use the trace configuration that comes directly off the tier, which I had found earlier, my electric distribution. And then I'm going to set my trace argument to be this subnetwork is what I'm tracing. And the configuration I'm going to use is the one off the tier. In other words, what I'm going to trace here is going to match exactly what an update subnetwork or a subnetwork trace in the UI would return. See how quick that was? It returned out all of my features. I get two types of results in here. I get elements as well as, uh, or sorry, I get an element result as well as a function output result. So if you do any, any math where you're saying sum up some network attribute, the function output result is where you'll find that. All of the features that you've traced are in the element result. So what I do is I simply find where the result is my element result, because that's what I'm interested in. And then for every one of the elements that come out, I'm going to grab its global ID and apply it into this list of GUIDs called All Features. 
The reason for that is that's going to tell the diagram when I say to create itself what features should be included. I'm going to create that diagram manager. I'm going to create a template of basic, the same as I had done with the previous RMT001. And now I'm just going to say create the network diagram. There's my diagram template, which is basic, and there's 6083, which is all the features that should be included in this diagram. Now, as that generates, it takes a, just a second or two as it goes and processes, and now I'm going to store that diagram. I provide it the name, in this case, basic diagram of RMT003. It takes just a second to create. I've defined the access for it, so public, so anyone can open, can edit this diagram. And then I give it a description, which right now is no longer correct, but you can call it whatever relates to your specific uh, data. We jump back out of there. We're going to skip over that last method for now. Jump back out to the UI. Now you'll notice it doesn't automatically appear here, and that is because this view is not dynamic. So to make it show up, you click the refresh, that reloads all of the diagrams that are within the extent of the map that can be seen. And now we can see that I have this basic diagram of RMT003, much the same way that RMT001, the full circuit looked much more detailed than the RMT001's subnetwork diagram. This one is the same. Now this is again a geo schematic with all of the features applied in it for RMT003. That's, that's using a trace to drive how we create that diagram. The last thing we're going to show about creating a diagram is creating a diagram from a known feature. And so what that means is that you could have a collection of known features. You could write a tool that a user selected some features and then went and generated a diagram. But in this case, I actually have a special template that's called a circuit breaker switching template. Now, what that actually is, is it's a template that you give a single feature to, a circuit breaker, and then it does the trace itself. And it does a trace and then some node reduction and actually generates a diagram that looks very similar to our system maintained diagrams. So I'm going through the same process. I get my diagram manager. I get, get the template that I want to drive off of. I create a GUID list of the features that I want to include in my template. I then generate the diagram using this create network diagram, providing the template and the features that I want to have it. So you notice I only passed in one feature, and yet when I store this thing, so all features, I, all diagrams I should mention as you create them are created as temporary diagrams. Uh, they, because of the SDK having its own sort of um, uh, disconnect from the Arc ArcGIS Pro in terms of accessibility, Temporary diagrams created within these co this code will only be accessible via the specific session that you're looking at. You actually have to return them out in order to get them. But by storing them, they then become readily available. I stored them, same process, I refresh, and now I can see I have my Circuit Breaker 8 feeder, which should look like a very simple, almost like one of those ne the, the system diagrams that were built of one of our circuits. So I created one feature, I was able to create a diagram with much more involved than that. So the last thing I want to show is updating an existing diagram. So we sort of touched upon that. We, we, we touched upon setting the a new algorithm, a, a smart tree on a non-smart tree um, network diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the network diagram that we are going to change. But what the user would want in this specific situation, or what I might be writing as, as an integrated add-in, is I actually want to change the root node, the thing that begins the smart tree. One of these switches down here is actually much more valuable and important to my user than this circuit breaker. So using some specific query, some information, I can turn around and go find a specific feature I want to make um, the root node. So I click that button, I go back here, get diagram manager, I get all those diagrams. I find the first diagram that contains that RMT001 and is system, because then it's going to find the correct one. I again create that smart tree diagram layout algorithm. And now I'm going to add a flag, and this is that root node, root junction. 
and I'm just going to give it the element ID that I know, which is 300. The switch has element ID 300. So what should happen now is that that element, element 300, will become the root node on the far left of the smart tree. I apply that out, that layout. And then when we get control back, so it, it, it takes a second to apply that layout because it has to remember, it has to keep processing all those other node reductions and all that other algorithmic information that I've stored within that diagram. So now it processes, it's going to run out, apply that algorithm, that layout, and it's then going to return back out to the caller. If I then go and refresh this, what I should see is that now the root node has changed to a feature that is more appropriate to drive my description. Now if we keep refreshing it, and it just creates that, that same smart tree, but now with a new root node. So really what we covered here is, is three or four key things. One, system maintained diagrams. You don't want to necessarily be editing and updating them, but applying new algorithms or layouts is absolutely appropriate and easily accomplished through the SDK. You can generate brand new diagrams using traces or using other mechanisms for getting a large selection. And you can create diagrams that use templates that do explosions out themselves to draw in a whole host of other features. So now back to you, Rich, to discuss more about the SDK as a whole. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Dave. Let's talk about one more piece of the Utility Network API, Pro Integration. This is a set of methods and classes that help um, the Utility Network API integrate with the rest of the Pro SDK. First of all, we have the Utility Network Layer class. So this class represents the Utility Network Layer in a map. It inherits from Composite Layer, which you can use to iterate through the dirty area and error sublayers. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, you can use the Get Utility method, Get Utility Network method, to return the actual utility network. So when you're adding buttons or tools to go in the ribbon in Pro, you use this config.demo file to control when that object is enabled. And there's a link there to the Pro SDK docs for it. So there's a new net utility network condition, and if you use this condition, that item will be enabled if there is a utility network layer in your active map. Um, finally, we have editor integration. So this is the preferred technique for editing within Pro is to use the high-level edit operation class. So what this class has is a set of methods on it for things like create, delete, move, and so forth. And every time you call one of these routines, it queues up a set of edits. When you're finished with the edits you want to make, you call edit operation.execute, which actually sends all those actual edits to the feature service. So in Pro 2.1, we extended the edit operation to support some utility network edits. In particular, there's a new set of association description classes that were added one for connectivity, one for containment, one for structural attachment associations. And you use these classes with the create and delete overloads on the edit operation class to create and delete these associations. Now what's interesting is you can in fact create an association between two features when the features haven't been created yet. What makes that interesting of course is that to create, typically to create an association, let's go back a slide, um, you need to pass in the two features and the two terminals to create that association, but how do you do that if you don't have the features yet? So there's a new create EX method on an edit operation that will return a row token, and you can take that row token and pass that to the association description classes. You can think of the row token as a pointer to a row that doesn't exist yet. Now, we also provide low-level geodatabase objects for editing. This is how you would do your edits in a standalone application using Core Host. But we don't recommend using that in an ArcGIS Pro add-in because um, the map is not refreshed and the undo-redo stack is not modified when you use those routines. So I'm going to hand things back to Dave for one last time to have him show us a sample of an editing application.
Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, so now we're going to jump into a demo about editing and the editing API. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show actually three different ways to accomplish the same kind of edit using the SDK, just different parts of the SDK. So let's walk through those and then we'll have a bit of a example. So first I'm going to jump down to a location uh, where I'm going to do my editing. And what I'm looking to create is a fuse bank that contains three fuses. One for each of the phases that I'm interested in. So I want a fuse bank, I want an A phase, a B phase, and a C phase fuse within that, and I want them to be contained within it. So there's three different ways you can accomplish this task, and we're going to walk through all three of them. The first is using core.data, the next one is using edit operations, and the last one is using a preset template. Some are easier than the other. We're going to start with the most complex and work our way to the easiest. So the most complex way to do it is using core uh, data. So what I've done is I've actually created some tools here. Now when I click on them, they activate a sketch tool. And now in the sketch tool, I can click where I want the features to be created. So I click right there. And now we jump to the code behind as we've done in all the other demos. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to jump into this method. It's going to jump around a little bit because of the the threading nature of it and me running through a queued task. Uh, it's going to jump around a little bit, but now we're here. And so what we're going to do is, and again, because we're working with the geo database directly, it needs to run inside of a queued task. We're doing the editing. We need to be running on the main sim thread. And this is true for all of the examples, regardless of specifically how they do it. But what we do is we grab the, the location I clicked on. We're going to use that as our point. Make sure that we're setting Z values on everything. And then we're going to set a location for the fuse bank and each of the three fuses that we want to create. We're going to open the utility network the same way we've been doing this whole time. Grab the definition of it for later on. We're then going to, off that definition, find the network source for the assembly and the device. And then we're going to go and look up our asset groups and asset types for the features we're going to create. In this case, a medium voltage fuse bank of asset type overhead load break fuse holder. And then we're going to grab our asset group of medium voltage fuse from our device class. And we're going to find the asset type of overhead cutout fuse load break. Now what we're going to do is we're going to actually open the two classes, the, the uh, device class and the assembly class. So the fuse bank class and the fuse class get the geodatabase itself because that's where core.data works is it all works directly on the geodatabase. So we're going to set some information about our feature. We're going to create a new feature um, using the feature classes definition. We're going to find the subtype for it. And now we're going to say create row buffer passing in that subtype. That means that buffer that gets created is of that subtype to start with. The only other attribute we have to set is our code for our asset type in this case. 222 for that fuse bank. We do the same thing for each of the fuses, this time setting its asset type code to 565, which is that overhead cutout fuse load break. And then we set our fuse, our phase values. So this one is our A phase, this one is our B phase, this one is our C phase fuses. And then within an apply edits call, we are actually going to create all four of these features. That's going to the geo database, calling apply edits and, and, and creating those features. I'm now going to create elements, which is the utility network concept or abstraction of a feature or a row from the rows I just created. Grab those four elements. And now I'm going to start to create those containment associations. My fuse bank is my container. My fuse A, B and C are what's going to be inside. And I want them all to be visible because in this particular map that we're looking at, I have a query definition turned on so that it will only display things that are visible content, so I make it visible. Now one thing you will notice is that it's done, but nothing is visible on my map. So to get it to show up, I have to refresh the map, might have to zoom in and out a little bit to make it show up. The reason for this is that I'm using core data, which does not natively interact directly with the UI threads and with ArcGIS Pro or the editor. So instead, you have to get to a point where it'll refresh and draw directly out of the database all of your features that are that you just created. Sometimes it takes a little while. In the meantime, while that's drawing, and I'm sure we'll see a refresh happen as it goes, we're going to move on to the next type. So the next type, slightly less complex than that one, is called these edit operations. And so how do these work? 
So again, I get a sketch tool built. I'm going to click the location I want it to be created. And then we go into a queued task because we're still creating features. Just because we're using the editor doesn't mean we're not creating features. It jumps around a bit. And now we get in here. So what we actually do is create, we actually create an edit operation. That's the thing that's now going to allow us to do a whole bunch of work. We create the location information the same way as we did previously, except right away we generate the list of attributes for a fuse bank that we're going to create, that asset type, 222. We then generate what we call row tokens. A row token is something that essentially tells the system, I'm going to be creating this row, and I want you to do some things to it along the way. And you'll see where that comes in here at the end. So then we create our fuse A location, our fuse B location, our fuse C, and then we set the attributes for those three things. Again, we do this into a dictionary where we have a, a string object key value pair. String is the attribute name. Object is its value. Set those same phase fields to A, B, and C, as I did previously. But now I actually, through the edit operation, create EX. On the layer, my fuse layer, I'm actually going to create the tokens for my phase A, phase B, and phase C features. I'm then going to pull back a row handle, and that row handle gives me access to do other things. For example, set up some containment associations. So now I'm going to set up containment associations between my fuse bank using its row handle and the fuse A, B, and C using their row handle. I set them as true to be visible. And then I create the three edit ops. Now, once I say edit ed op edit execute async, it will fire all three of those creates simultaneously. It will create the, con the containment associations and it creates the features. So as you can see, they're also selected. You'll also notice that the map was refreshed. Now we finally see the geo database data.core features get created. As well, we saw the edit operation get created. The reason we see the map refresh there is because it is interacting directly with the editor itself, and the editor knows to go and refresh any active maps. The third way, and potentially the easiest way to, to augment within the pro environment, is that to use what we call preset templates. So when I click using a preset template, I've already created a template that every time I click with this type of a template, it's going to create that fuse bank, the three phased fuses, as well as all of the associations. All I have to do to make this work is give the edit operation a name, find the template, my preset template that I'm interested in. In my case, it's called fuse bank with three phase fuses. I create the edit operation with its location where I want it to go, and then I call execute async. And again, just like the edit operation, it refreshes the map automatically, selects the things that were just created, and displays them. You see dirty areas in all these features because of those containment associations being created. Now, obviously, the final two extensibility points I showed only apply to the ArcGIS Pro Editor's API or SDK, whereas that first core data I showed can apply uh, in any headless application that you want to write. So it does not have to work uh, specifically within the pro environment. So thank you very much, Rich. Back to you. And that is how editing works. Let's wrap up by talking a little bit about what's coming. So, and what's new as well. So since the Dev Summit in 2019, we've added a diff bunch of different things in 2.4 and 2.5. Um, the version numbers that are there on the right-hand side. So Probably most importantly, we've added isolation tracing with the isolation tracer class. We've also fixed the operator precedence for AND and OR, which wasn't working properly. Um, added new trace configuration properties for include barriers at starting points, uh, ignore barriers at starting points. So this is useful if you're doing, um, for example, an upstream protective device trace. So if you run that trace once, you will find um, your first device upstream and typically what you'd want to do is you'd want to place a starting point on that first result and then possibly run the trace again and with this option uh, without this option that second trace would actually stop at the first result because that first result satisfied the trace criteria 
So what ignore barriers at starting points does is it lets you um, continue moving on if the first point, uh, if your starting point meets the trace criteria. Um, include isolated features that's used in conjunction with the isolation tracer class. By itself, the isolation tracer class will return the devices that isolate the section of network. So for example, you know, typically that'd be a section of gas valves. So with the include isolated features um, option set, it would also include the pipes and the customer service points within that isolated area. Um, we support attribute substitution with propagation. Um, we now support subnetwork retrieval by name. So if you know the name already, you can get the subnetwork without having to, to loop through all of them to find the one that matches. And then finally, we made some changes to the attribute rules APIs. Um, technically, that's, that's not um, a utility network thing, but those two technologies go hand in hand. So I listed it here. So in terms of the road ahead, probably the biggest thing on our plates right now is working on non-spatial object support. Um, that's adding objects to the utility network that don't have shape. That's very useful for telecom and for underground electric as well. We also want to add filter barriers. Um, this is a barrier that you place much like a regular barrier, but this particular barrier would work as a filter and not with traversability. If you remember that section where I talked about um, the difference between traversability and filters and that the traversability will prevent you from um, making it to the source. So one of the big use cases here is the ability to model a squeeze off by placing a filter barrier. Squeeze off is something often used in conjunction with a gas trace. And finally, we're going to add some more control on how features are updated using update subnetwork. All right, so um, this, I think, is a good introduction to the APIs about the utility network. However, you might find yourself wanting more information before you start coding. So I wanted to give a quick overview of the help that is available. Um, if you go to the Pro SDK homepage, um, there is a nice little box there called Utility Network. This brings you to, clicking on that, brings you to the conceptual doc, which is a very long uh, document organized much like this that goes into more detail on all the different classes and methods. From this page, you can also click on samples to get a set of samples. Um, right now, we have three. One of them demonstrates how to use the schema classes to list out all of the asset types that support a given category. So you know from the network properties dialog you can tell which categories are supported by asset type. This kind of gives you that opposite, um, opposite information. We have a load report sample that does a downstream trace and creates a report that sums the load and counts the customers per phase showing you how functions work as well as tracing in general. And we have a tool that lets you place a transformer bank. This shows how to create a transformer bank assembly, including the, the bank, all of its contents, and all the associations to go with that. Um, this is a GitHub site. You are certainly welcome to write your own samples and post them up there for everyone to, to see and to use. Um, also, if you have suggestions on specific samples you'd like to see, please let us know. Um, underneath samples, again from that Pro Concepts page, is a link to a thing called Pro Snippets. And what snippets are is they are small pieces of code that show how to accomplish a specific task. So we've got a big set of things there. Um, this is code that you can often just copy and paste right into your app and use as is. Of course, from the Pro SDK homepage, there's the API reference, which will give you you know, for each class, all of its methods, and, you know, all the help on a per-method basis. And finally, I want to point out, exclusive to the utility network, um, from that conceptual doc page, there's also a link to an object model diagram. So this gives you kind of an old-school object model diagram showing all the classes and methods in the utility network API and how they all interact with one another. All right, with that, I want to thank you for watching, and you can use the QR code below to get the session materials that go along with this talk. Thank you very much.